Hello, saints. Peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody is blessed today. Uh, in this study, we're going to be answering the question, When will the Feast of Trumpets be fulfilled? And in answering that question, we're going to find out if there is a significant connection between the rapture and the Feast of Trumpets. Now, why did God tell Israel to keep this feast? Who is this Feast of Trumpets for? And where in God's Word is the Feast of Trumpets mentioned? So what we're going to do is we're going to study this out. We're going to rightly divide the Word of Truth. And in doing so, we're going to answer the who, what, where, when, why, how type questions. Now, if you're new to this channel and you have no idea what right division is, if you've never heard the phrase rightly divide, then I highly suggest you start with the foundation of right division. There are several several videos on my channel all about right division. And a good place to start would be in the study we did on the book of Acts, all 28 chapters. And the two links on the screen are going to get you moving in the right direction into understanding the basics of what right division is. Okay, now let's begin. Looking at the display on the screen. The veterans out there of right division know what this is. Some of you perhaps don't know. Now, let me explain what's going on here in this visual that we have. This, this image on the screen is Israel's prophetic program. The dispensation of law to kingdom from start to finish. Now, this next image is Israel's prophetic program till the death of Stephen. Then we see our program today, the mystery revealed to Paul. Then once the rapture happens, we see a return to Israel's program, right where Israel left off with Stephen, Peter, and the other 11. So one chart, if you will, on this chart here is all about Israel. And the other chart is about the kingdom program postponed for the grace program. Now, we know that all the feasts began back in Moses' day in Israel's program. So we're going to use this chart for the time being. Now, let me propose a question to everybody. If the nation of Israel had repented, if they had repented, would have accepted Jesus as their prophesied Messiah, then when would have the Feast of Trumpets been fulfilled? Think about that. All seven feasts were given to the nation of Israel as rehearsals for future events, which would have been fulfilled by Christ Jesus, correct? So, what event or events would have fulfilled the Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles? Now, the Feast of Trumpets was given to the sons of men. The, the Jews had been practicing that feast since the days of Moses. It was part of the laws. They were commanded to observe these feast days. It wasn't an option for them. It was the law. And we'll see that these feast days are called the feast of the Lord. These are his feast days given to Israel. Now another question. If the first four feasts were fulfilled in quick succession at the first coming of our Lord Jesus, then why wouldn't the final three feasts be fulfilled just as quickly at the second coming, following the pattern that our Lord God set with the first four feasts? Does it make any sense that the Feast of Trumpets would be fulfilled, then seven years later the remaining two feasts Atonement and tabernacle would be fulfilled? See, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't follow our Lord's pattern. The Hebrew word for feast is moadim. It literally it means appointed times. Or what we would call today, you know, having an appointment. And these moadims, these appointments, these feasts, were kind of like parallel rehearsals for a future event that only the Messiah could fulfill. Israel was commanded by God through Moses 
to keep these seven appointments by law. Interesting note, there are seven feasts, just like there's seven days in a week. And the completion of God's plan on the earth will be a total of 7,000 years. So we see seven days, seven feasts, 7,000 years. The Feast of Trumpets, along with Atonement and Tabernacle, begin in the seventh month. The seventh feast, feast is also a feast representing a period of rest or a Sabbath, which we're going to see in Leviticus. And the seventh thousandth year, the millennial reign of Christ Jesus, is also known as the Sabbath rest, the day of rest, the day of the Lord being 1,000 years long. The seventh feast days, or the seven feast days, were broken up into two different groups, right? The first group is in the first four feasts, which were observed in the springtime at the beginning of the year. The other group are three feasts being observed in the fall at harvest. It's a parallel of the Old Testament saints being harvested, resurrected at the last day. Now, let's take a look at where Israel was commanded by law to observe these appointments or feasts. In Leviticus chapter 23, God speaks unto Moses and tells Moses to speak to the children of Israel concerning the feasts of the Lord. Now in verse 1 through 22, it's all about the first four feasts, okay? Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit, and Pentecost. Verse 23 is where we're going to begin with the remaining unfulfilled feasts, trumpet, atonement, tabernacle, the last three fall feasts. Now in Leviticus 23, in verse 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of that month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, before we go any further, you might have noticed I capitalized some words there in that scripture, okay? And I'm also going to be putting certain phrases and quotations. Now, this is done only for the purpose of this study to highlight certain words and ideas and so on. Now, I highly suggest you follow along in your King James Bible as we move forward so you can see where these verses are located at, all right? Now, in Leviticus 23, 23, the memorial of blowing of trumpets. Notice. It's the first day of the seventh month. Also, an offering made by fire can be a parallel to Israel who will be baptized by fire on that great and terrible day of the Lord come. Israel was simply commanded to memorialize the day by blowing trumpets and to keep the day as a Sabbath day of rest. This feast in Hebrew called Yom Teruah, okay, the day of blowing of trumpets. You can see that in Numbers chapter 29 and verse 1. So in scripture, Israel is commanded to keep this memorial feast by law on the first day of the seventh month, which is determined by lunar cycles, by the moon. This is the same day that the Jews celebrate Rosh Hashanah or New Year. Now that can be confusing and it's important to take note that Rosh Hashanah is not found in Scripture. Rosh Hashanah literally means head of the year like our January 1st New Year's Day. However the New Year or Rosh Hashanah was not applied to this feast until at least the second century AD 200 years after they rejected their Messiah 1500 years after God commanded Moses to start these Moadim, these feast days. Rosh Hashanah is part of the Jewish secular calendar which designates the beginning and first day of the year. 
all right now some of you might already be confused and and part of that confusing setup is because they don't believe Jesus was their Messiah who filled the first four feasts the Jews literally changed the Lord's feast days 200 years after Jesus came they reversed the calendar months the real beginning of the new year according to God's Word is in the springtime which is why the Feast of Trumpet is in the first day of the seventh month how can the, the start of the new year be in the seventh month right well that's because Jews use two different calendars one is secular and the other which is the one that contains Rosh Hashanah the secular version and the other is God's true calendar which was given to Moses okay and it's being hidden for a reason now take a look at the screen on the left you see what God gave to Moses all right to give to the children of Israel on the right you see changes the Jews made to the calendar in the second century AD 200 years after Jesus came another name for Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hadin the day of judgment now that's an oxymoron now there's a lot more we need to look at concerning the Feast of Trumpets and we're going to but first let's finish Leviticus we have two more fall feasts to cover atonement and tabernacle which are going to play a big part in identifying when the Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled okay also as we read about atonement and tabernacle I want you to think about the event surrounding the second coming think of Matthew 24 specifically I want you to think about the parables of our Lord Jesus the ones that he spoke about concerning the second coming now for example the gathering of the tares and wheat by the angels the scriptures concerning two being in the field how one was taken and one is left another one would be the parable of the dragnet how the angels separated believers and unbelievers the the good fish from the bad fish at the end of Daniel 70th week so let's look at Leviticus 23 in verse 26 and the Lord spake unto Moses saying also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement it shall be a holy convocation unto you and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord and ye shall do no work in that same day for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day he shall be cut off from among his people now let's look at the Feast of Tabernacle the last of the seven feasts in verse 33 and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel saying the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord on the first day shall be a holy convocation ye shall do no servile work therein seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord on the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord it is a solemn assembly and ye shall do no servile work therein now in the chart on the screen we see the first four feasts Passover it was fulfilled when our Lord Jesus was sacrificed as the perfect lamb the blood sacrifice for the atonement of sin paying for and taking our place in wrath and judgment and then unleavened bread which is also fulfilled when Jesus was placed inside the tomb first fruits fulfilled when Jesus rose back to life from the dead in full righteousness and glory also recall there were some Old Testament Saints who came out of their graves and were seen by the Jews at the same time that Jesus rose from the dead and then we have Pentecost fulfilled when God poured out his Holy Spirit on Peter the Apostles over 3,000 Jews kingdom Saints remember all harvested first into the kingdom program then a memorial of trumpets which is not fulfilled yet 
which we're going to cover in detail in the rest of the study. Atonement, not fulfilled yet either, is when the kingdom saints, Israel, will be put through the worst of God's testing and judgment and wrath. Tabernacle, again, not fulfilled yet. That's going to be fulfilled when Jesus returns and dwells, or tabernacles. That's what the word tabernacle means. It means to dwell with among the people of the earthly kingdom. This is going to be during the 1,000 year period, okay, after the second coming event. You can see that. And read Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. So we see atonement and tabernacle being fulfilled at the second coming. And now that leaves the feast right before atonement and tabernacle, the feast of trumpets. All three taking place within the same couple of weeks in the seventh month. Now again, Leviticus 23, verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of that month, or the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now first, let's look at what these trumpets were, all right? In Israel, they used two different methods of sounding the trump, okay? They, they have the ram's horn, what we know as the shofar, and obviously they have an, a metal instrument called the trumpets. They can be made of silver, gold, brass, whatever. Now, an interesting factoid that I discovered while researching this study is the bullhorn. You know, those bullhorns the police use today, and also the street preachers often use them to scream their kingdom gospel in the streets? The bullhorn goes back to the days of Moses when the Israelites would use a bull's horn that is directly tied to the worshiping of the golden calf. They worship the bull god, the Taurus bull. However, when they repented from worshiping the golden calf and the bull, their idol, they chose the ram's horn because it was the ram that was stuck in the thicket branches when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac. God supplied a sacrifice for Abraham, a picture of a future offering once again by God, which would be his son Jesus Christ to be offered as a sacrifice for mankind. So it's interesting that these street preachers today are using a bull horn, an instrument directly tied to idol worship, and they have no idea. Anyhow, I thought that was interesting. The trump is the sound coming out of the source. In other words, you can have a trump coming out of a shofar. You can have a trump coming out of a trumpet. The word trump simply means the sound coming out. So when we read the phrase trump of God, we now know it's the sound that God is making. It could be his shout, a voice, a call, whatever. And knowing what the trump of God is helps us understand Paul's rapture passages in Thessalonians and Corinthians, which we're going to look at at the end of the study. The shofar, the ram's horn, was blown to call everyone to assemble to proclaim a gathering, to announce an arrival, to warn of a, an imminent battle or war or judgment. Also, it was used to announce the arrival of their king. Now, God told Moses, who then told the Israelites, that this particular feast had to be held on the first day of the seventh month within the system of lunar cycles. In order to know when the first day of the seventh month was, they had to keep count of the moon cycles, the lunar months. And they had to wait for the new moon, which would indicate to them when the seventh month was to begin. Then they knew when the first day was of that seventh month. According to their custom, it took two witnesses to determine when the first day of that month was. 
That's interesting. Two witnesses announcing something. This is all a rehearsal, remember. They're using two witnesses for a reason, which they didn't understand at the time, but they will in the future when that rehearsal becomes a reality. The two witnesses waited until there was barely, barely a sliver of light on the moon. Then they announced the beginning of the seventh month. Then they could start the Feast of Trumpets on that first day. There's a time at the end of the month when the moon is absolutely black. You can't even see it. And when that moon begins to wax again, meaning a small sliver of light begins to be shown on the moon, that's when they knew it was the beginning of a new month, the seventh month. And that happened every month, okay? The beginning of a new month happens every month. But the seventh month was a special month, as we see. They coined this event with their phrase, the day and hour that no man knoweth. Now, why did they call it that? Because no man knew what day or hour the sliver of light would be seen on the new moon and the trumpet day would begin. That month, the seventh month would start. You see, the condition of the moon began the feast. The right condition would fall on one of two days because they might not have the conditions needed to see that sliver of light on that moon on the first day because of the weather or something else. So the two witnesses might have had to wait until the weather cleared up to see it the next day. Then they would signal to the Israelites that the beginning of the seventh month had taken place and it was time to start the trumpet the feast trump the trumpet feast all right indeed no one knew the day or hour in which this would take place except god and the two witnesses also it's important to know that trumpets or trumps of the shofar were used all throughout the fall feast and trumpets atonement and tabernacle and so on in fact it's common today for the Jews to include all three feasts under one name. They simply call these 21, 22 days the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, where else do we see two witnesses arriving on the scene to announce something to the nation of Israel? Where else? As a side note, this would be a good time to interject something else here. Why will Israel build another temple? Now, first of all, keep in mind that the nation of Israel, for the most part, doesn't believe that any of the feasts have been fulfilled yet. They still think their Messiah is coming to fulfill Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, and so on. In order to adhere to the law concerning these feasts, they had to perform oblations and sacrifices and offerings and so on at the temple in Jerusalem. Now, something is going to happen soon that is going to convince the nation of Israel that the day of the Lord is at hand. Thus, they will build that temple, the citadel, the high tower, and resume in keeping the Lord's feast days. And that's something that's going to happen besides the two witnesses showing up on the scene will be complete and utter chaos around the globe. Something is going to trigger the Jews to get serious about things in a very quick manner. Now, back to our study. Let's look at some examples in Scripture in which this parallel phrase, the hour no man knoweth, is used. Now, there's a reason why Jesus used that phrase. He was talking to Jews, remember? In Revelation chapter 3, in verse 1, and the angel, unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If 
therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now Jesus is speaking about the day of the Lord come. His return to set up the earthly kingdom. The kingdom saints asked Jesus when he was going to come back to set up their earthly kingdom. In Mark 13, look at verse 32. But of that day and that hour no, knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. The Jews would have understood this phrase to mean that Jesus was going to return at a time associated with the fall feast at the sound of a trumpet, which will announce the arrival of their king. Trumpet, atonement, and tabernacle all play a part in the events surrounding the second coming, the day of the Lord come, okay? There's a difference between the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord come. The first part of the second coming event, trumpets, will be fulfilled with a great gathering and assembly, which is exactly what it means, with the announcement of the coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now let's take a look at some scriptures surrounding that fulfillment. In Matthew 24, in verse 31, and he shall send, who's the he here? Our Lord Jesus Christ. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they, the angels, shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, if, we, if you recall in our study concerning two in the field, one taken, one left, that event will also take place during the period of the second coming at the end of Daniel's 70th week. First, the angels gathered the tares, unbelievers, and they're burned. They're taken away. Just like people were taken away in the flood of Noah. They were all taken away to be judged. Okay? Unbelievers taken away to be judged. And the angels are also going to gather the wheat, believers, from one end of heaven to the other, bringing them all to be gathered before our Lord Jesus on the earth. Matthew 13, 30, Let both grow together until the harvest, the wheat and tares. Let them both grow together. And in the time of harvest, which would be the end of Daniel's 70th week, I will say to the reapers, who are the angels, gather ye together first the tares, unbelievers. Notice that the angels come and gather the unbelievers first and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat, believers, into my barn, the earthly kingdom. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he shall reward every man according to his works now something interesting here what I just mentioned earlier about these reapers Matthew 13 30 let both grow together until the harvest in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers the angels what are they gonna do they're declaring war these are the army of angels coming back with Jesus Christ they're sent out to gather first the unbelievers, the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. This is an army of angels. They're coming. They're not coming to throw a party, friends. They're coming back for vengeance and judgment and wrath. And it's also important to notice the word works. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall reward every man according to his works. That's a huge, huge clue to understand who he's talking about here. We know that works is all about the kingdom program during Daniel's 70th week all the way to the end and during till the end. Mark chapter 8 verse 38 Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, 
of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his father with who the holy angels what are they going to do gather the tares and the wheat now jesus tells us what it's going to be like when these angels gather everybody also in a different parable uh, parable in matthew 13 47 again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind he's talking about fish right which when it was full of those fish they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good fish into vessels these are the believers but cast away the bad fish unbelievers so shall it be at the end of the world at the end of Daniel 70th week at the last day which is the second coming the day of the Lord come so shall it be at the end of the world the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just the tares and the wheat the good fish and the bad fish and shall cast them into the furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth now the next thing we can look at in scripture it, talking about scripture talking about the association between a trumpet and the end of Daniel 70th week in Isaiah 27 verse 13 and it shall come to pass in that day okay the day of the Lord come that the great trumpet shall be blown and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcast in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem Jeremiah 419 my bowels my bowels I am pained at my very heart my heart maketh a noise in me I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard O my soul the sound of the trumpet the alarm of war remember earlier I said a trumpet was used to announce war coming war combat Zephaniah 1 14 the great day of the Lord is near it is near and hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord the mighty man shall cry there bitterly that day is a day of wrath a day of trouble and distress a day of wasteness and desolation a day of darkness and gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fence cities and against the high towers verse 17 and I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as dung neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy for he shall make even a speedy, speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land now let's look at some scripture talking about the correlation between the trumpet and the resurrection of the Old Testament and tribulation saints again Matthew 24 31 and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together there's that assembly his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another to the other Isaiah 26 19 thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead there's that relationship between the resurrection the last day and so on and Psalm 17 14 from men which are thy hand O Lord from men of the world which have their portion in this life 
and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure, they are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. As for me, I, King David, will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Okay, he's talking about resurrecting at that last day back to life to rule and reign on the earth with Jesus Christ for 1,000 years. Revelation 20, chapter, uh, chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were, being, that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they did what? They lived. They lived. They were resurrected back to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's the tribulation saints that are going to be resurrected. The martyred tribulation saints are going to be resurrected at the second coming to reign with Christ Jesus on the earth. Matthew nineteen twenty eight, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the man of uh, I'm sorry the son of man shall sit in the throne of his glory ye ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel who's ta who's that talking about Jesus was talking to the 12 apostles he told them flat out you guys are going to come back to life and rule with me on that day you're going to be part of the, all the judges you're going to be 12 judges on the earth judging the 12 tribes of Israel John 6 38 for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will but the will of him that sent me and this is the father's will which hath sent me that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day there again he's talking about resurrection of the 12 apostles John 6 44 no man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day who uh, John 6 54 whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. John eleven twenty four. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, Martha was a Jewess. She knew all about the Old Testament saints being resurrected at the last day, at the second coming, the return of our Lord. So at this point, we've seen how the Feast of Trumpets is connected prophetically to the day and hour no man knoweth, which is the day of the Lord come, the second coming, when he comes to set up his earthly kingdom. Also, the gathering of the resurrected saints and tribulation saints, the assembly of the wheat, kingdom saints going into the earthly kingdom promised to them, and also the trumpet blasts announce wrath and judgment, the day of atonement. Then, after Jesus is finished pouring out the worst part of his wrath and judgment, atonement, will come the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus dwelling with and ruling over the kings and priests who will be ruling the world for 1,000 years. Now, if you recall from a previous study, Jesus says the beginning of sorrows takes place in the first half of Daniel's 70th week. The first four to five seals in the book of Revelation, between the fourth and fifth seal, okay? Jesus says those are the beginning of sorrows. Then great tribulation will come for and upon Jacob, Israel. That's Jacob's trouble, the last half of Daniel's 70th week which leads up to the grand finale of the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So the last feast, tabernacle, we're told, 
they will continue to practice all throughout the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ Jesus on the earth. Zechariah 14 verse 16, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feasts of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. See, if they don't go up every year at the Feast of Tabernacle to worship our Lord Jesus, they just won't get any rain back at their nation, which means no food, basically. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. All throughout the Old Testament, there are patterns, events, and types and likenesses of events that parallel to a future prophetic event. And we can look at a couple of these. Here, we're going to see a type of Daniel's 70th week, a type of the Feast of Trumpet, a type of the Feast of Atonement and Tabernacle, Joshua 6 and verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, surround the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once, that thus shalt thou do it six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, or the shofar, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass, that when they make a long blast with that ram's horn, or the trump of the ram's horn, trump of the shofar, whatever, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. Remember, the Feast of Trumpet is all about trumpets and shouting, right? And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So we see here in the story of Jericho, seven priests, seven trumpets, and seven days. Notice that after six days, on the seventh day, they march around the city seven times. And on that seventh time, they sound the long blast of the ram's horn, the trump, along with shouting. And it's at that point the city crumbles to the ground. A reference to the destruction of Babylon, the whore of Babylon, the worst of God's wrath at the end of Daniel's 70th week. So there's a pattern there. And what we have is a picture of 6,000 years, and in the start of the, the 7,000th year, the millennium, then we're shown another period of seven years, right at the beginning, represented by the priests marching around the city seven times. And on the seventh march around Jericho, which again is a picture of the seventh year of Daniel's 70th week. So at the end of the seven years and also the last three feasts being in the seventh month, what do we see? There's a loud trump of the ram's horn with shouting. This is a clear picture of the Feast of Trumpets announcing the worst of God's wrath. And we read that the people will ascend up into the city. They're gathered and assembled into the earthly kingdom. A parallel picture of the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the gathering of those who endured until the end of Daniel's 70th week. So we see huge parallels here in Daniel's 70th week. All these events surrounding the second coming, the Feast of Trumpet, Atonement, and Tabernacle. And there are many, many parallels all throughout the Old Testament concerning several prophecies. 
And you're going to find similarities between King David and the King of Kings, Christ Jesus. And in the book of Revelation, we have two witnesses that will arrive before the worst part of God's wrath. That's a parallel to the two witnesses needed before the last three feasts can begin. The false teaching going around saying that the rapture is going to happen in the Feast of Trumpets would be backwards. The feast would be fulfilled before the two witnesses in Daniel's 70th week even show up again backwards. Now, some of you might be thinking about the 1260 days from the abomination of desolation to the second coming, telling us exactly when the second coming event is going to take place, right? Well, take a look at Zechariah 14 and verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day, that day, the second coming, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And it shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye, who's ye here? The fleeing woman, okay, shall flee to the valley of the mountains. These are Jews. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Now these saints here are, again, the angels. Okay, the word saints can mean holy ones, it can mean angels, it can mean several things in the gospel. Verse 6. And it shall come to pass in that day. What's that day? The last day, second coming event, the return of Christ, the end of Daniel 70th week, that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. Not day, not night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. You see, at the end of Daniel's 70th week, there's going to be so much chaos going on with the sun, the moon, the stars, the atmosphere, the earth, that no one is going to know what even what, what the time is. Never mind knowing what day of the week it might be or even the month. It's going to be a time of complete and utter chaos. Only the Lord will know the day and hour that the second coming events are going to take place which will fulfill the last three feasts. You see that? The day and hour no man knoweth, a parallel to no man knowing when the seventh month would begin unless there'd be two witnesses first. We saw how there are two witnesses needed to announce the start of the last three feast days, a rehearsal for when two witnesses will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, talking about events surrounding the second coming. Just like the first four feasts were fulfilled in quick succession by Jesus at the first coming, so will the final three feasts be fulfilled in quick succession by, guess who? Jesus Christ at the second coming. Now, the damage that non-right division causes is traumatic to the body of Christ. It's traumatic to the world. It causes things like thinking Matthew 24 is the rapture. Thinking that two in the field, one taken, one left is the rapture. Thinking that the unknown day or hour is the rapture. Thinking that we replaced Israel. This all leads to stealing Israel's appointments and making them our own. It leads to believing in the wrong timing for the gathering of the body of Christ. It leads to a works-based religion, Israel's works program, the kingdom program. It leads to stealing the bride's identity. These are just a few examples of what happens when people choose to ignore Paul's commandment to rightly divide God's truth, his word, all 66 books of the King James Bible. We see the beginning of attacks on right division in the book of Galatians. Take a look on the on the study we did 
back you know a couple of months ago on the entire book of Galatians it's on my channel all six chapters are studied out step by step and I highly recommend you go and watch it right after you watch 28 chapter study on the book of Acts in the book of Galatians Paul addresses a problem with the body of Christ being deceived into keeping the Jewish laws and traditions just like today the body of Christ is being told that they had to keep all the laws in order to be saved and that caused all kinds of confusion which we still see happening even today it's a works based salvation that we see it's a false gospel Paul addresses the Galatians and explains to them that they're doing everything wrong and how to fix it and we see part of that fixing that solution at the Jerusalem Council Paul made it perfectly clear that the body of Christ had nothing to do with keeping the law and that includes the feasts circumcision uh, temple worship sacrificing oblations and so on and so on and so on trying to work your way to heaven and all the feasts assigned to Israel were all part of keep, keeping the Mosaic laws for them, Israel, for their kingdom program to be fulfilled. Paul addresses the law versus the body of Christ all throughout his books. And, you know, one other book is Romans, especially Romans. We look at Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. What's the deeds of the law? Works and feast and circumcision and so on Romans six fourteen. for sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law but under grace Romans ten four. Paul is addressing the nation of Israel for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth okay now let's conclude this study by taking a look at the events surrounding our gathering unto Christ Jesus the rapture but first this needs to be made clear Rosh Hashanah was added in the second century AD 200 years after almost 200 years after the temple was destroyed Rosh Hashanah is a secular celebration it's not part of God's calendar okay turning the seventh month into the first month of the year it's backwards also the celebration uh, of blowing of trumpets 100 times is also rabbinical tradition not something that started at Mount Sinai with Moses's laws this tradition of blowing the trumpet 100 times and the last trump not being known when it's blown and all that is part of Rosh Hashanah it's part of the rabbinical traditions that came along in 2nd century AD they they termed it the last trumpet or trump okay the last trump of the shofar which they also attached the hour no man knoweth that the hundredth blast would come to the day and hour no man knoweth that we see which starts the seventh month right so they created these traditions attached to the secular celebration of Rosh Hashanah as very 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 important to understand listen no man on this earth is going to dictate when our Lord Jesus returns to the earth no man no shofar no hundredth blast it ain't gonna happen God's Word however tells us what the day and hour no man knoweth is it's the first day of the seventh month which is the start of the memorial of blowing of trumpets okay he's when he talks about the feast day and it's also a parallel reference to the day and hour no man knoweth at the end of Daniel 70th week towards the fall uh, right around the three feast time period and only our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be able to determine the day the time the hour because our sun and moon and stars and, and atmosphere and everything is going to be so so much in chaos that no one's going to be able to understand what day or hour or time it is the feast being a rehearsal is a parallel 
to the day and hour of the event surrounding the second coming. It's a warning. It is a gathering and resurrection. Then, after that, it's the worst of God's wrath. Then, he will live among his people. Trumpets, atonement, and tabernacle. The problem we have today, first of all, not rightly dividing. That's the number one problem. Second of all, Gentiles who act Jewish, thinking that it makes them more special in some way, like to take Jewish traditions that are not even in the Bible and mix it up with Paul's writings, which does nothing but confuse everyone, and it leads to date setting and false doctrines and all kinds of messes. Again, right division is the key to understanding God's Word, understanding who we are, where we're going, and our relationship in Christ Jesus. Without right division, you're open to every false gospel on the planet. You will be tossed to and fro your entire lives, and you will never be secure in your salvation in Christ Jesus. You see, salvation security is directly proportional to your understanding of right division of God's truth. That is a fact. I have been on both sides. I've lived it. I am telling you the truth. And the rest of my brothers and sisters out there who rightly divide God's truth can vouch for what I'm saying. Now, let's take a look at the, the rapture right, real quick. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. Remember, trump is sound that God's making at that point. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now in verse 13, the word ignorant is used. That means Paul is about to reveal something that's never been revealed before. Okay, he's trying to educate them here concerning part of this mystery. And in verse 15, by the word of the Lord, that means that this harpazo mystery is something that Christ Jesus revealed to Paul. Something unknown to Paul previously is part of the mystery. Now, if this was something unknown to Paul previously, then it cannot be something concerning the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, which occurs at the end of Daniel's 70th week, part of the second coming. Because Paul was very well versed in scriptures concerning the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. He knew all about that. And most likely the Jewish believers in the body of Christ would have also known all about the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. That was no mystery to them, right? They weren't ignorant about that. But here we see a mystery, something new, revealed by the Lord to Paul in verse 15. And we see the first mention of the mystery concerning the harpazo of the body of Christ in 1 Thessalonians, his, first, his second book, Galatians, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, so on. So that uh, brings us to the next time Paul addresses the harpazo in the second letter that he writes to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now the phrase, as from us here, indicates that they received a letter that had a forged signature of Paul's on it, and the letter wasn't from Paul. It was all a lie, and the letter caused a lot of panic for the body of Christ at Thessalonica. Because in the letter, the forger told them that the second coming event was upon them, that they were in Daniel's 70th week. That's what bothered them. You see, the forger should have used the day of the Lord come 
the second coming. Instead, he used the day of Christ. Apparently, he didn't know the difference. Most likely, the forger was someone from outside the body of Christ, but he was knowledgeable about the kingdom program, or Judaism. He was familiar with the Jewish religion. Now, in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day <clears throat> excuse me, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So in verse 3, Paul says, For that day shall not come. See, Paul is referencing the second coming here. Now, how do we know that? Because he continues to describe the events of Daniel's 70th week <clears throat> that had to occur before the Lord Jesus would return. First, Paul explains as the falling away, the apostasia, the deception causing the apostasia, okay, the falling away. Then, at the middle of, uh, of Daniel's 70th week is the Antichrist is revealed, the man of sin. Then, the event surrounding the second coming, which the forger called the Day of Christ. Now, I have a very detailed video on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 on my channel that you might be interested in. If you want to look further into this, I'll post the address on the screen here in case you haven't seen it yet. Now, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was with yet with you, I told you these things? See, Paul told them all about the events leading up to the second coming, the end of Daniel's 70th week. In verse 6, And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Okay, in verse 6, Paul confirms to them who is holding back the Antichrist and those things from taking place in Daniel's 70th week, Paul is referring back to verse 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him. Paul is telling them that our gathering together unto him has to take place first, then Daniel's 70th week, then the coming of Jesus Christ at the second coming, which the forger called the day of Christ. Okay? Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. The he here is the body, the building, the members. It's us. We are the he that has to be removed to end the dispensation of grace so the dispensation of the kingdom can resume. And think about that for a minute. If Paul would have taught the Thessalonians, okay, that the rapture was at the end of Daniel's 70th week, at the second coming, then why would they be so upset? They would have been happy to be in Daniel's week because if Paul would have taught them the rapture was at the end, they would have been happy because the rapture was about to happen for them. They wouldn't have been troubled. You see, the reason why they were troubled is because that it's not what Paul taught them. It's the forgery that upset them. Paul taught them that their rapture had to come first and they wouldn't be in Daniel's week. The Thessalonians were troubled because the forger, his letter, was telling them the opposite from what Paul had taught them in the first place. Now the fact that they were troubled is a huge clue to figuring out the context of that passage that Paul wrote is, okay? Now we move on to the next letter where Paul mentions the Harpazo to the Corinthians. And this letter was written after First and Second Thessalonians uh, was sent to them. So, it makes sense that Paul is about to go into more detail concerning the catching away. He's not going to repeat exactly what he told the Thessalonians in his first two letters because by that time the Corinthians had already read those letters and received the same instruction. So, instead of repeating things in his letters, Paul, in keeping with his style, Usually, when he brings uh, up the same topic, he goes into it more detailed, okay, concerning that topic. He keeps building upon his previous letters, right? Which is why it's a good idea if you study, uh, when you're studying Paul's letters, study them chronologically, the order in which he wrote them, 
right? Which is not the way they're in the Bible, by the way. You're going to have to look that up. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, comma, at the last trump, colon, for the trumpet shall sound, comma, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, in verse 51, again, we see this mystery. Okay, that tells us that Jesus revealed something new to Paul that he never seen before. So, that tells us that it can't be part of the Old Testament resurrection at the end of Daniel's 70th week because that was common knowledge amongst the Jews. Then in verse 52, we have uh, first, in a moment, comma. Second, we have in the twinkling of an eye, comma, at the last trump, colon. It's very important. Now, remember what we talked about earlier concerning the word trump. It is the sound that something makes, okay? And here, it's in reference to the trumpet. It says, for the trumpet shall sound. That's the first, tr th that's one trumpet, okay? Making the first sound. There's one trumpet. Then Paul says, the trumpet shall sound, okay? That one trumpet sounds. <clears throat> so that's the first time it sounds. In that moment, raises up the dead. Then the last sound, trump, of that same trumpet or the second sound of the same trumpet we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and caught up so Paul is explaining in more detail here than he did in the first letters to the Thessalonians the timing of our gathering the rapture is not dictated by any feast day however the timing of our rapture is explained even further by Paul in his letter to the Romans in Romans 11 verse 25 for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Fullness of the Gentiles gives us a clue to when the rapture is going to take place. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know, according to God's word, that Daniel's 70th week is for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews. God is going to remove his focus off of the Gentile nations, the grace period, and turn completely to the nation of Israel, just like it was before Paul, before the mystery of the body of Christ. Jesus' earthly ministry was all about to and for the nation of Israel, the kingdom program. And we know that when Israel rejected their last opportunity by killing Stephen, that's when God took the focus off of Israel's prophetic program then his focus went on to the Gentiles through Apostle Paul, building a body of believers in Christ Jesus, neither Jew nor Gentile, but members of the body. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the mystery revealed to Paul. That is the he, the withholder, the restrainer that's preventing the Antichrist from coming to power. First, the dispensation of grace has to end before the, disp the continuance of the kingdom dispensation can begin again. You can't have two. The rapture is what's going to separate this. The fact that no man can know the day or hour when the fullness of the Gentiles is going to be made complete, that's a parallel to the day and hour come uh, being on the same, uh, on the day and hour no man knoweth as well at the end of Daniel's 70th week. There's so many parallels and types all throughout God's truth. That's why we need to study all 66 books, rightly divided. And don't let that confuse anyone. Okay, Seeing a parallel after the mystery was revealed doesn't mean that the mystery was seen in the Old Testament scriptures. That's not the case. The creation of the body of Christ was kept secret from men since before the foundation of the world and only revealed to Paul after Israel rejected their Messiah. Ephesians 3, 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, given to Paul for us, the body of Christ, 
how that by revelation he made known unto me, Paul, the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. As I stated at the very beginning of this study, if you're not familiar with right division, I recommend you find out what it is. I recommend the book of Acts here on this channel. It explains the transition from Peter to Paul, prophecy to mystery, Israel to be the body of Christ, and so on. The foundation of what right division is, according to 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, trying to make the feast of trumpets, the rapture of the body of Christ, is stealing Israel's identity and purpose which is what the enemy has been trying to do since Cain and Abel trying to stomp out the seed of the woman it's called replacement theology and it's from the pit of hell we're at the time in our existence that now is most definitely not the time to play around with traditions that are not found in God's Word stick to God's truth only I don't know about you all or y'all but I don't think I'd follow traditions from a group of people who strayed so far rejected their Messiah killed him who are now blind and fallen as a nation okay that's not something I'd put my trust in at this point in time it's gonna take total chaos and destruction to wake them up to the truth of who Jesus Christ really is Jacob's trouble a time like never before nor ever will be again for mankind God's Word is the only thing that's to be trusted because he cannot lie never ever ever take the word of someone and run with it always make the King James Bible God's truth his word your number one source of truth always check out what someone says always check out what they're trying to teach see if it compares to what God's Word says don't assume they know what they're talking about just because they have doctor on their name don't assume they know what they're talking about because if you've noticed most preachers with doctor on their name happen to be in a denomination that's what you'll notice they happen to be in a denomination who preaches non right division they don't rightly divide they don't know the difference between Israel and the body of Christ they don't even you know some of them are convinced that Matthew 24 is the rapture I mean how sad is that they're completely confused and they're leading millions of people right off the cliff we are so close so close beloved Saints the rapture the gathering could happen today tonight tomorrow morning next week next month but it's gonna happen and if you open your eyes and you look at the big picture you can see the world headed in one direction right now and Daniel 70th week is the only direction it's going into don't go into Daniel 70th week please please join us when we get out of here before Daniel 70th week you don't want to be here all right anyway I pray this study has been a blessing and edifying for someone out there. I know it has. Unto Christ Jesus be all the worship, praise, and glory. Amen? Amen.